Welcome to UVM Innovates, stories of innovation from UVM entrepreneurs. We're very pleased that you're here and you could join us for this kickoff event for Innovation Week. Before we start, I'd like to particularly thank the Entrepreneurial Forum, a group of 30 plus faculty, student, and staff members who over the last year have been looking at things entrepreneurial and have helped to plan this event. I'd also like to thank Mike Sherling and BTV Ignite for giving us the opportunity, as well as our good friends at Seven Days. And let's have a round of applause before we start for our 14 dem uh, demonstrators in the back of the room. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Richard Galbraith. I'm the Vice President for Research and Scholarship and creative arts, and entrepreneurship, and innovation, and design. I also do windows. <laughs> so I have to tell you, I've been at UVM for 21 years. And the initiatives that my office are engaged in now are some of the most exciting ones and have led to some of the most interesting and engaging work that I've ever been in, engaged in. And I want to thank you for supporting this and for your enthusiasm for this and the fact that so many of you have come here today to hear about what we're doing. In a moment, I'll explain how the rest of our day is going to go, but right now I'd like to introduce to you the president of UVM, Thomas Sullivan. Good morning. Thank you, Richard for the introduction and particularly for all that you do for UVM. I also want to thank our provost, David Rosowski. I know who he's here. David, thank you for the leadership in this very important uh, area for the university uh, as well. Welcome everyone for this kickoff for Innovation Week. Um, so many exciting programs, opportunities for conversations, showcasing such a vibrant ecosystem that we have here in Vermont and in Burlington and here on our campus as well. We're so glad to host this first ever um, event where we're bringing people together. Many of you work very closely with each other, but I think it's important that we, the state's flagship research university, participate as fully and possible as we can and host as much of these conversations about discovery, about creativity, and about innovation in our state and, of course, well, well beyond. I, too, want to thank BTV Ignite and Seven Days for their wonderful sponsorship of this week of innovation. When you think about the breadth of the creative innovation, learning and discovery that we here at UVM believe is happening, in an attempt to fuel so much of the entrepreneurial activity that Richard just referenced. So many of our faculty and staff and colleagues are here to help participate and make contributions and in turn be a driver of economic development for the state of Vermont. I saw when I came in this morning a new brochure. It's our annual publication that we have here at the university on uh, inquiry, and it really is, as Richard was describing his own job, really is an opportunity for us at the university to showcase the research, the scholarship, and the creative activity among all of our faculty, and how absolutely related it is one to the other. <clears throat> I want to just spend a moment telling you of all of the activities that at least I know are going on here at the university. And of course, this innovation conference is going to describe in much greater detail the interrelationship of these wonderful ideas uh, and exploration. Uh, last year, for example, FY16, the University of Vermont received more than $138 million of external research, scholarship, educational funding for our faculty to be able to think about the big issues that you are talking about here, the really creative ideas that are taking place at the university. In the last 16 years, from 2000 to the present, we have had 
27 startup companies come out of this university through the, exactly the areas that you are talking about in this conference. The University of Vermont is, as I mentioned a moment ago, an economic engine of this state. $1.33 billion a year come from this university into our economy here in Vermont. And we can see from this innovation conference how all of the exciting innovations and the big ideas that are being explored, faculty, staff, students, community leaders, entrepreneurs, really are going to showcase, as you'll see, the lightning rounds that will be offered here and throughout the week. One of our keynote speakers today, of course, is a well-known Briar Alpert, who is president and CEO of Biotech. We're very proud of him because he's an alumnus of this university, exactly the kind of student that we want to be able to embrace for their intellectual curiosity. And I'm also pleased to say that he's also one of our university board of trustee members. Well, let me share with you some of the great national news that your ideas, your collaboration, and this community has been receiving in the last year. Um, of course, as Richard said, the Vermont Center for Emerging Technologies and the uh, makerspace, the generator makerspace, are adding so much to bringing us together and working with our leadership here in the city of Burlington as well to make this one of the most innovative entrepreneurial hubs uh, in the United States. So what has the national press said about your activities, your collaboration, and our community of innovation and entrepreneurship? Well, last year, the Kauffman Foundation ranked Vermont fifth in the United States for startups. Forbes magazine ranked Burlington among the top 10 innovation tech hubs uh, in the United States, particularly citing all of the patent activity and giving credit for most of it coming out of here, the university. Atlantic Monthly called Burlington, Burlington the Silicon Valley of the East. CNN Money Magazine, Fortune Magazine, and Money Magazine all cited Vermont on their top 10 list of innovative states, again, citing the creative intellectual property coming out of our communities. I have every reason to believe that our steady increase in research dollars that are supporting research creative activities and scholarship at this university will propel even to the next level this entrepreneurial activity that's so important to our economy and to our society. The culture of interdisciplinarity in discovery and innovation at the University of Vermont give all of us wonderful opportunities to study and to learn across many sources of disciplines at the university. In asking big questions, in trying to understand the consequences of this innovation revolution that we are in. Critical questions that will help us understand the next level of innovation and entrepreneurship and its effect on society. We here at the university, I hope, are ideally poised to use its research and the scholarly expertise here to help all of us unpack the scope and the breadth and the complexity and the speed of this innovation revolution. Klaus Schwab described in his most recent book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, some of what is happening to us, and you will all be discussing it throughout the week. Think about this for a minute. The confluence of these big ideas, such as artificial intelligence, robots, 3D printing, self-driving cars, drones, nanotechnology, and biotechnology, including gene editing and sequencing, and of course, the importance of complex data as we attempt to analyze millions of pieces of information. And with our business school here, an opportunity to look at whole new business models 
as you put these big ideas into operation, including the disruptions that will come from new innovations. Importantly, while our scientists and our engineers and our medical professions are going to be exploring and discovering the new innovations in this tech revolution, our teacher scholars in the humanities and in the social sciences and in the arts can play a very revealing role for us as they help unpack the consequences of new technology and the tech revolution on society. On society, in our labor markets, in consumer purchases, and what effects, positive or negative, the new technology will have on all of our lives. And our faculty can help us understand not only technology's effect on our societies, but also society's effect, whether positive or negative, on the advancement of new technologies. In short, innovation and technology are having and will continue to have profound change effects on all of society. And it will be, as we all know, on a global basis, from the economics to society to the ethical and political perspectives. And yes, there will be new public policies that will have to shape our better understanding of the innovation revolution and its consequences. And the mega trends that come with all of your great, creative, enthusiastic, big ideas. We are in a changed world and an interconnected global society. And it will affect all of us at each piece on the spectrum of society. And yes, along with new change, along with new laws, will also come regulations, new regulations, sometimes considered by those in the innovation world as the enemy. But we will have new regulations. And we, the citizens, and we at the university should be in the forefront of helping to inform and shape what those new laws and those new regulations should be as we better understand technology's effect on our society and on our culture and society's consequences too and helping inform the technological revolution. If you think about it, the sheer speed and complexity and impact of these innovative changes, it's going to be hard for all of us, I think, to fully understand that impact, at least in real time. But that is where our university community can play a significant role, as we promote interdisciplinarity in our curriculum and in our research and in our scholarship. We can help unpack those mysteries and help others understand as we understand the effects and the consequences of those effects on society. Right down, as I said, to consumer choices, to labor market consequences, and perhaps even to equality or inequality divides. That's what we hope the University of Vermont can add to your important creativity an understanding, a fuller understanding of the di dimensions and the consequences of this fabulous innovation revolution that we are involved in. I hope that one could say that UVM is playing a consequential role in that understanding and that discovery and that inquiry as full partners with each of you. Finally, even though you're going to work hard this week, enjoy it. This is a wonderful opportunity for us here to host and in our community beyond the interchange, the intellectual interchange that you will all share with each other and the new ideas and creations that will come from this wonderful conference. To all of the organizers, Richard and your team, David, others here in the room,
congratulations, have a fabulous week, and let's think about the interactions of all these big ideas on society and how that may play out in public policy in a very positive way. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Tom. Um, so we're going to move straight into the program, um, and we're going to start with uh, lightning talks, or what we refer to as, some people refer to as a slam. So we're going to have six entrepreneurs that are connected to UVM. And I'm going to say that we chose six out of many. And as you know, we have recently heard the Nobel laureates announced. And you should take comfort from the fact that those that weren't Nobel laureates were considered long and hard before they were decided to be passed over, and then in many ways just as good as the people who got Nobel laureates. So the people who aren't presenting today, please don't take that in any way as a diminution of your contribution. So each uh, presenter is going to have five minutes, and I mean five minutes, no longer than five minutes. Please do not go over five minutes. You do not want to go over five minutes, I can assure you. And the idea is for you to tell us about your entrepreneurship. You have only one PowerPoint slide to do that with, and there will be no questions during the presentations. All of the presentations will occur back to back, all six in a row. After all six of the presentations, each entrepreneur will head to the tables in the back of the room. They have signs on them indicating which table they're at. And that's a time when we have about 20 minutes to go and choose a table, sit down with a particular person, ask them questions. You can move from table to table. You can look at the exhibits. You can drink more coffee. Uh, you can chat in the aisles. And then in about 20 minutes after that's over, uh, we'll, we'll come back for our keynote address. And that will be, as you've heard from our special guest, Briar Alpert, who's CEO of Biotech a very successful company with its roots in UVM. So, are you ready? Our first speaker is Peter Silverman, a UVM student and CEO of Beacon LLC. Please. Thank you, that was really nice. Uh, I'm gonna pull out a timer, because that, well, what was it, six? Si si six? <laughs> All right, uh, so my name is Peter, and I started Beacon alongside uh, Max Robbins over there. And I just kind of want to tell you about a personal experience that prompted me to realize an issue much bigger than myself, much bigger than UVM, much bigger than Burlington. And it's pretty much all of Vermont, and it's a huge problem in a lot of the country, and that issue is brain drain. So my experience freshman year is I was a business major. I took my classes. I did pretty well. And then I had an internship in Boston. And what ended up happening was I had this internship because I couldn't find anything in Vermont. We have resources, but a lot of them say three to five years experience, you have to know this, you have to know that. And as a college freshman, that's not really feasible. Between getting oriented from not being away from, from being away from your mom the whole time and just learning how to do classes and taking tests. And after that I did a moment of I completed my first semester, the job descriptions generally asked me, you should have been doing digital marketing for three to five years. And I don't think that was possible. Um, so at that point, I was like, all right, well, I'll go to Boston. They'll, there's a million startups there. I can talk my way through and hopefully just get an internship. And what ended up happening was I did my three months there. And I was OK at it, but it wasn't really my calling. And this kind of sparked my brain. I was like, wow, like a lot of people only do an internship like junior or senior year. And I'm a freshman, so I have three more years. I'm fine. I can choose around fields. I can explore more. I can learn new skills. But a lot of people, when college is over and they've only had one or two internships, it's like, that's kind of your only experience. So Max and I had this idea, and we're like, well, why don't we start building skills now like in a, in a small way? How do we connect with the businesses in Vermont? I don't have time to go to Boston. I don't have time to actually drive down there. So Max and I did some research, and we're like, why can we not find any jobs in Vermont? It's because the companies are small. 80% of companies in Vermont actually have less than 10 people. So what we realized is, OK, well, they don't probably have an HR person, or if they do, they're very busy. So who has to take over hiring for an intern? Well, it's like, oh, it's like Dave the marketing guy. And it's like, oh, well, how does Dave like, allocate this out? It's like, well, he puts other projects on hold. 
And it's like, oh, well, that's not very feasible for him. I understand now. So what ended up happening was, I don't know how to switch the slides. Is there a keyboard or something? That's my only slide. I had a cool animation, though. Man. Oh, that's so lame. OK, cool. No, that's fine. OK, OK. So college students and the local businesses, they don't see each other, right? But this, oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> so we created a platform where they can talk to each other. Basically, Beacon is an opera. It's a, it's a website for college students that has a lot of users since our uh, website launched about a month and a half ago where they can find volunteering opportunities and paid projects. So the difference between this and something like Indeed is it's not finding a job or an internship that lasts three months, six months, a year, like infinity or whatever. It's for college students. We want to be able to try a field. We want to be able to work with a company and see if we can provide some value to them. So an example would be uh, Burden Snowboards. They want people to find graphic designers, right? And a lot of the times, they go through staffing firms. They'll pay a lot of thousands of thousands of thousands of dollars, and they'll try to find the best exact student to do their graphic design. But our system, instead, it basically is we give students paid projects. So we can give 10 students projects where they will draw something for 10 hours, and they'll fit it in between their schedule for college kids. They fit it in their classes and their one test that week, and mock trial, and debate club. Because they have a Wednesday, Thursday free, but it's the weekend. They want to go out and explore Burlington. They want to go on dates. They want to eat nachos. We're college students. So if we can actually find a way to integrate uh, learning skills and working with companies into our schedule and get comfortable with that, we can grow our experience while expanding our own resumes, building a portfolio, getting connected with local businesses, and reducing brain drain for the University of Vermont. So what we've done is basically create a platform where businesses who don't have time to hire can post projects and volunteering opportunities to, one, include the student body in more of their business activities, as well as uh, try to grow their experience. And regardless of if it turns out to be a job offer, which it happens a lot of uh, these projects do turn into job offers, because like, we even use our own system. We're like, oh, man, you graphic designed like, um, a really nice sell sheet. Like, oh, please keep doing more stuff for us. But um, uh, <laughs> basically, it, it builds the portfolio. So even if they don't get the job offer, if they get the portfolio, they get something on their resume, they spent their time wisely, they made some money, and they can now spend more money in uh, the University of Vermont, Burlington, and like, be more engaged in the culture. We actually have money to spend. We can go to stores downtown. We can explore. And uh, it's a really great ecosystem that kind of filters in through itself. And uh, that's all my five minutes. Wait, five, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Peter. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Jeff Froelich, Professor of Electrical Engineering at UVM and co-founder of Packetized Energy. Did I mention it's only five minutes? Five minutes. Out of my way. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Froelich, as was mentioned, and I'm here representing Packetized Energy. So Packetized Energy is a startup that's leveraging UVM-developed IP to uh, remove the barriers to a renewable energy future. Okay. So traditional energy forces, uh, sources, that is the dirty fossil fuel ones, are good in the sense that they can be managed so that you can track uh, the supply with the predicted demand. Right? But renewable energy, as I think everyone recognizes, uh, you don't have that control over. So for example, on the upper left here, we see uh, solar power generated over the course of a day. And in this case, it's in Arizona. So you can see that there's a lot of variability related to renewable energy. So in short, the renewable energy uh, future is one where we're not going to be able to manage the supply as we are today. So packetized energy is looking at trying to solve, uh, solve the reverse problem. That is, how do we manage the demand to track this variable supply? There are many uses of electricity that we can shift when the uh, device is on or off. Uh, throughout the course of the day without really impacting uh, uh, customers' quality of service. So these things include hot water heaters, electric vehicle chargers, pool pumps, if you happen to have a pool, and uh, maybe deep freezers. All right? So uh, this concept of controlling these type of uh, resources is called demand response. And demand response uh, takes two of different forms based on the programs that are available today. One type of demand, uh, demand response program will collect a bunch of information from a customer on their behavior, when they want to charge an electric car, 
things like that, and then push down to all the customers a schedule on when their device will be on or off. So this has issues as we see them. One, the customer has to think about their energy use and is also providing a lot of information to the utility. And this raises privacy concerns. Second type of approach doesn't even care what the uh, customer wants. It's basically directly managing the device in the home depending on the supply needs, right? So packetized energy approach uh, addresses both of these shortcomings as we see them. We manage the delivery of energy much as data is delivered in the internet. Instead of saying a long string of bits, um, data is broken up into small uh, packets, and each one of those packets is individually managed depending on the bandwidth available in the network. So we're doing the same thing with the delivery of energy. So in the upper right picture, you can see that the demand is being broken into little chunks. And we're taking that demand and managing it in real time to the available supply, as kind of shown in the cartoon on the lower, lower right there. Okay. So how is this energy coordinated? So the way it works is that your device in the home, let's say electric hot water heater, is sending a request to the grid, to the utility, for one packet of energy. And if there's availability, then that device can turn on for a very short period of time, which we call an epoch and that's, say, maybe 10 minutes. If there's not available supply at the time, the device will come back a little bit later and ask. All right. So if there's adequate supply, the heater's allowed to turn on. So these requests are being made anonymously. All it asks, all the utility is knowing whether there's demand or not. And so there's no privacy issues at that point in time. And it's driven by the customer's real-time needs. Right, so we're maintaining the quality of service to the customer. From the utility side, the requests are coming from a lot of different places, from many, many small loads. So the utility can match the supply to the demand or the demand to the supply with very high fidelity. And we see this in the lower left figure here. In the red, we have uncoordinated demand, right, of in this case 300 hot water heaters. And the black is real wind data that we're running in the simulation. And you can see at the beginning, they're not lined up at all. There's no coordination between the demand and the available supply. But once packetized energy management starts, the demand is following the supply lockstep. Right? So we view this to be a very powerful technology. Uh, the company was founded by myself and Mas Almasaki and Paul Hines. We're all in the Department of Electrical and Biomedical Engineering. Uh, we are co-founders of packetized energy and inventors of the technology. Uh, in parallel to our little startup effort, uh, we have a very large ARPA-E award where we continue to do research on the technology to quantify, for example, uh, performance guarantees. We founded the company in May and have hired a very talented Vermonter, uh, Andrew Giraud, who you might have talked to in the back, and uh, he will be at the table to talk to you very shortly, I think. I think my time's up. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Um, our next speaker is Shannon Mitchell, Chief Operating Officer of Game Theory, who is joined by uh, UVM faculty member Lizzie Polk from the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Please. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for having <laughs> us. Uh, we're representing a game called Camp Conquer that we've developed, and it stemmed out of the desire to help motivate high schoolers to be more physically active because the majority of high schoolers do not achieve the Center for Disease Control recommendation of 60 minutes of physical activity a day. And so we were asked by the health department in the state of Vermont to help figure out how to address this really difficult population for public health researchers to motivate. My research is on obesity and how to make healthy choices the easy choices. And so I was trying to think of ways to incentivize high schoolers to be more active. And one thing we heard when we talked to staff and high schoolers themselves is that they were always playing games on their devices all day at school. And s staff was not so happy about that. But um, we thought, well, maybe we could use that for good and develop a game where students would be rewarded in the game for perform performing real world physical activity. And so we've developed, um, we focus grouped with a lot of high schoolers to find ways that we could 
make a game that they'd be really excited about playing. And so then the game, they wear a Fitbit, and for every um, activity that they record on their Fitbit, they receive rewards in the game. And I'll let Shannon talk about that part. Okay, so I'm sure a lot of us have been through the experience where you get up, you're like, today's going to be a fun, healthy day, and you go to the gym, and it's a great gym day, and you're really tired, and then you do it again. Uh, for me, it's usually around day three or four where I'm like kind of struggling to get myself out into the gym or to pick that nice wrap over like a pizza or something. Uh, and for high schoolers, I feel like they definitely have that problem, and with school and everything else, it's really hard to motivate them. So uh, one thing that we do at Game Theory, we make games, and games are really, really good at getting people to do things that are fun uh, and that don't otherwise make a lot of sense. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to spend your day clicking at a computer, but something about games makes people do it anyway. At Game Theory, we like to boil down games and find out what makes them tick, what makes people happy, what keeps them doing this. So with physical activity, uh, people feel rewarded on its own. Physical activity uh, and health, healthiness is good for you. But uh, we thought if we take an awesome game, we can layer it over and add some more rewards that keep people going in that in-between phase. Uh, so when we gave people Fitbits, we designed this game that reads in the Fitbits, and every step that you take counts as a piece of gold in this game. Uh, so like I said, we're working with high schoolers, so we thought, what rewards high schoolers? What do they like? What are they into? Uh, we talked to a lot of them. So what they told us is that they really like to kind of fight with their friends. They're really competitive. They want to win. Uh, and they like to talk to people and work with their friends and be competitive with others. The other thing that's really important to them is having a strong sense of identity. They're like, this is my cool t-shirt. This is my backpack. This is what I like doing. So we thought, we're going to build a game where they can use these motivating factors within the game space uh, and link that up with the physical activity factor. So in our game, Camp Conquer, teams are split into two groups. So everyone in the study gets their own team, red team and blue team. And we uh, set them up against each other in a massive uh, online water balloon war, where every day there are battles where you fight to, uh, not the death, but you know, uh, you fight to be able to win. Uh, so to be able to play the game and get cool gear and power up your character, you have to take steps to be able to buy your awesome gear and to buy water balloons. And if you're not able to do that, you're not able to take part in the fight. Uh, so part of it is the game's fun. We get some awesome art. It's cool. And kids like the concept. They were the ones who sort of came up of, with the idea of having a dodgeball style game. Uh, but the other part is there's the social factor. You're playing with people you know, with people who you like, and there's a little bit of social pressure to keep going. You know, if you don't uh, put your character down and pick your spot for the game, you know, your team's going to have an issue. They're not going to have enough players. They're not going to do as well. Uh, the other thing we're rewarding players for is when they get a reward when they win the game. Uh, they get the gems and the gold from that. Uh, and they also get rewards for improvement. So it's not just, you know, the track kid's going to be running every single day. You also have the kids who, like, maybe they didn't run for a whole week, but if you start running, you'll get even more rewards. Uh, so by balancing that uh, and creating a social environment with fun games, fun gear, uh, we've been able to create something that we think can really work towards social change and helping students become more fit and more active. Great. Yeah. That's our game. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon and Liz. Um, so next we're going to hear from Mike Coleman, co-founder of Easy LLC and a former UVM mechanical engineering professor. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for the, uh, to the organizers for the invitation to uh, be here. It's a great opportunity and uh, we at Easy are, are grateful um, to participate. Um, we are Easy uh, Tactile Graphics for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Easy is engineering to assist and support you. Um, uh, our, the founders uh, are Josh Coffey, myself, and Mike Rosen. And if you know Mike Rosen, he has a fetish for meaningful acronyms. So uh, Easy stands for engineering to assist and su uh, support you. Um, among the three of us, Mike Rosen is the funny one. Josh is the smart one, and I do all the work. 
Um, so so uh, uh, I have a short amount of time. I just want to make sure I get through this sort of three columns up here. Um, this uh, uh, company literally started as a seed. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the, the formation of the company and the, and the support we got from um, UVM and, and other sources, and then talk about the suite of products um, that we've developed. Um, so this, uh, uh, in, in 2008, um, uh, we started a, an engineering project with the National Federation of the Blind um, as part of the, the seed uh, um, course sequence in mechanical engineering. And uh, SEED stands for um, Student uh, Experience in Engineering Design. It was founded or started by uh, Mike Rosen. And um, uh, it, it partners, it tries to partner students with outside entities. So through, through a chance meeting with um, someone who's connected to the National Federation of the Blind, uh, we got in connection with Al Manecki, Dr. Al Manecki, who's a mathematician, who's the STEM and now STEAM coordinator for the National Federation of the Blind. And everything this company is about is freehand raised line drawing. What is tactile graphics? What is raised line drawing? Everything that's of graphical nature or pictorial uh, nature um, has to be felt um, through the hands or other means. And um, the idea is that freehand drawing is an essential skill for things in everyday life, in education in the workplace. Um, and we're focusing especially on education. So um, the National Federation of the Blind has a, has a tactile graphics literacy campaign. It's in conjunction with their Braille literacy campaign. They're trying to raise expectations, increase opportunities. That's the theme for everything they do as an advocacy organization. A startling statistic is that 70% that 70% of working age adults are unemployed. And one way to, to tackle that problem is through increasing um, um, work opportunities for, for the blind and visually impaired in STEM fields. Um, so that's where we're focusing. Um, it's, it's just unfortunate and sad that um, someone like Dr. Manecki, who was a number theory um, person, could not pursue geometry, one of his favorite things, because he didn't have the proper tools for doing uh, drawing and, and uh, tactile graphics. Um, we formed the company um, from this sequence of projects at uh, UVM in this um, uh, seed course after three years. Um, and uh, we got great support uh, financially and otherwise from the Office for Technology Commercialization through their innovation fund. They also helped us um, gain two patents for our uh, devices and, and products. Uh, the NFB is um, a source of uh, mentorship and also inspiration, but not only that, they um, have a 20% um, ownership uh, in the company. Um, we have membership in VSET, who's been uh, great with uh, all the support they've given us um, business-wise and, and uh, office-wise. Um, we got an NIH phase one, and now we're in the middle of a phase two grant for a million dollars um, to develop uh, one of the, the three of the uh, things in the suite of products that we're developing. Um, we work closely with advocacy organizations for the blind. Um, we, uh, we couldn't do it without this, these relationships. Um, it's where it all started, and it's what drives us now. Um, we work with the Texas School for the Blind, for instance, the Perkins School for the Blind, Louisiana Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, as well as the NFB. Um, and also we work with uh, the arm of Pearson Publishing that is um, developing uh, accessible uh, technology. So we have a sketch pad, a printer, and an eraser that we've developed, all for the, the purpose of creating for the very first time um, things like workbooks uh, that have not been available to the blind. And um, we're very proud to be a part of that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks very much. Uh, let me now introduce you to UVM alumnus Chaz Smith, co-founder of SAP, SAP, exclamation mark.
Hey, my name is Chaz Smith. I know a lot of you guys in the crowd. Um, I graduated from the UVM Sustainable Entrepreneurship MBA program. We have a table back there also. Hi, Susan, uh, if you guys want to check that out too. Um, so SAP is a startup beverage company based here in Burlington. Um, we have two flagship products. Both are made from pure maple sap, so what maple syrup is made out of. If anyone wants to know more about maple sap sp specifically, I can talk to you guys after at our table. Um, but I want to just tell you guys why I'm really excited about this opportunity uh, and excited to start this business. Um, and I think it really embodies a lot of the values of UVM uh, and Semba specifically. Um, this is what I kind of refer to as a triple win business. Uh, it's a business that can be really profitable, but also at the same time create a lot of environmental value and social value as well. Um, it keeps trees in the ground. Uh, if you know anything about the maple industry in Vermont, uh, it's a lot of really hardworking middle class families who really rely on maple uh, to provide their income for the year in a lot of cases. So if we can do well, Vermont can do well, and a lot of people can do really well at the same time. So there's a really underlying kind of fundamental factor of this that really means a lot to me beyond just the business itself. Um, and so I started the business with my cousin, uh, Nikita Salmon, who owns his own maple farm in Art Hill, Vermont, and his parents also own a farm in Enosburg Falls, Vermont, near the Canadian border. Uh, so maple is really uh, something we've been doing for a long time, uh, Nikita specifically, too. Um, so it's something that we, maple is something that we understand really, really well. Um, Nikita is really an expert in this space overall. Uh, and we've really joined together in this really great partnership uh, where uh, he really is running the production side of the business uh, and I can really focus on some of the bigger strategic pieces of the business and we've just worked really hand in hand to uh, take this off the ground from last year really starting this company being in two stores to now being in about 300 stores including most of the Whole Foods in New England and, and growing really rapidly which is really exciting for us. And uh, I think what's also really attracted to me, attracted me to this business uh, in this set of products overall is that um, the beverage industry is, is changing really dramatically right now. You know, five, ten years ago, I don't know if these products would have really done that well because people weren't thinking about the health concerns around soda or, or a lot of the uh, just what's in our food uh, overall, in our food and beverages. But now there's been this huge sea change where we're seeing about $2 billion being spent or, or being removed from the Cokes and the Pepsis of the world and being injected into these new products uh, because consumers are finally changing their preferences. They're looking at what's on the label. And so when we were kind of evaluating this space and looking at maple sap as a, a beverage option, what we really realized was, you know, this isn't just a one degree upgrade from, you know, what's on the shelf right now. It's not, you know, putting cane sugar in a product where it had sugar before. Uh, this is actually taking, taking a product, uh, looking at the craft soda space and making something that's two, three, four degrees better where you're still having a sweet experience but you're also getting tangible health benefits at the same time. It's almost leapfrogging a whole set of products on the shelf right now. And so as we look to develop new products, as we uh, kind of evaluate this space overall, what we're seeing is a tremendous opportunity to uh, still give consumers what they want, which is a sweet experience, but give them tangible health benefits at the same time. And I think if, you know, there's a lot of work that's going to go into this. At the, at the end of the day, you can have great products. You have to have great marketing, too. But there's a huge opportunity for us to take advantage of this disruption and provide consumers with a whole new set of products that they can really enjoy uh, and, and feel good about drinking at the same time. Um, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, and uh, last but certainly not least, UVM alumna Sasha Mayer, co-founder and CEO of Mamava. Sasha. Get my slide up there, Jean. So this is uh, myself and my co-founder, Christine Dodson, at the Burlington International Airport with the uh, first of its kind freestanding lactation suite, our Mama Va lactation suite. Uh, I heard someone describe an entrepreneur once as someone who is not good at one particular thing, except for maybe persuading other people uh, to join their vision who were good at other things. And I think I definitely fit into that category. 
So I wasn't quite sure which story to tell today to persuade you of my thing, but I, uh, I landed on uh, a little bit of the journey that took me from UVM to uh, the reluctant entrepreneur that I am today. Uh, I identified as a feminist from a very early age, and actually my first day of kindergarten, I met my teacher, Ms. Hutton, not Mrs., not Miss, Ms., and I came home to my mom and I said, I will be Ms. Mayor, and I have been Ms. Mayor ever since. In my uh, very suburban high school, I joined a group called Students for Peace and Survival. Some irony there, considering the comforts that we were living in. Um, and at UVM, I minored in women's studies. And the day after I graduated, I started to work for Congressman uh, Bernie Sanders. So after about two years of that, anybody who knows Bernie um, could recognize that I went running to the private se sector. <laughs> and uh, I landed um, at a place called uh, JDK Design. This is, place is now called Solidarity of Unbridled Labor. So you can see that there's a sort of socialist thread that runs through my, my life and career. Mamava was incubated at the design studio that helped bring Burton Snowboards, Xbox 360, Magic Hat, and a bunch of other brands to the world. And I worked there until last September. My co-founder, Christine, still actually splits her time between Mama Vaughn and Solidarity Design. So 10 years ago, I was a breastfeeding mother, and I had a great supportive workplace at JDK and a place to pump. But my challenge was, when I hit the road, I was constantly using my breast pump in restrooms, in closets, in once the backseat of a client's car. So as you can imagine, very substandard locations for places to feel relaxed and to make food for your baby. On Labor Day of 2006, I was uh, nursing my baby and I read a wonderful piece on the cover of the New York Times. There's a lot of poet poetry there. It's Labor Day. It's uh, uh, nursing my baby, and um, it was an expose written by a wonderful journalist named Jody Cantor, and she was most recently um, written a piece about the culture of work at Amazon, so you might be familiar with her name. So anyway, she wrote about the health benefits of breastfeeding and identified the fact that there was a corporate class of women like myself um, who had the autonomy at work and had the break time and um, the ability to meet her breastfeeding goals. But many other hourly wage workers weren't afforded the same space um, or time, and really she identified this two-class system where health begets wealth and um, health begets health and wealth begets wealth, and, and really a big disparity. And that's where the seed was planted for me. So I took this idea back to the design studio to help find a solution. We were also experiencing a baby boom, and so a lot of people recognized the need. So we created our plug and play freestanding lactation suite that made it easy for moms to have a private place to pump or if they chose to breastfeed their baby and also be very easy for facilities to provide that location. When the Affordable Care Act mandated that employers provide this place, um, other than a bathroom and the break time to do it, we actually had a business case. A friendship with Jean Richards, who is the director of the Burlington Airport, provided the perfect testing ground for our first prototype. I didn't actually leave my job at the design studio to work full time on Mama Bond until last September, so most of our growth has happened over the last year. We now have placed our lactation suites in 16 airports and about 120 other locations across the country. Our pods are in places that I never dreamed of, like Fenway Park, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, the MIT Media Lab, and even the Milwaukee Zoo. Basically, we found that if a woman works there, or if a woman goes there, these accommodations are needed. As I reluctantly prepared to leave the design studio last August, I got back in touch with our uh, journalist, Jody Cantor, and I shared our story. And then she wrote this follow-up piece and took the occasion to announce the birth of her second child 10 years after the first article that inspired our concept. That's it. Thank you. So before we start uh, our keynote session, uh, I'd like to ask uh, President Sullivan back to the podium to introduce a special guest. Welcome back, everyone. 
We do indeed have a very special guest today. Senator Patrick Leahy and his wife, Marcel, are with us. When the senator heard that um, UVM was sponsoring this week-long innovation conversation and gathering, um, he asked if he might be able to stop by. As you know, Senator Leahy is Vermont's senior senator, and he is also the senior most senator in the United States Senate. It is always a delight to have Patrick Leahy and Marcel back on campus. Senator Leahy, please. <laughs> Tom, thank you very much. And, you know, Marcel and I love being here. And, of course, we're proud parents of three UVM graduates from here, and, uh, uh, and it, which is, really means a lot to us. And I, I think about how UVM, when our youngest son was in the Marines, was here and he got called up for the first Iraq war. And UVM said, fine. You come back, when you come back, tuition, we're refunding everything this year. Your tuition will not go up, and your classes will still be there. And, and UVM made, well, you were special, all of you. And one of the things about this, we're just, just looking at the backpack uh, that attaches the bulletproof vest back there. Uh, I look at the innovation around, around the state. I, uh, and it is encouraging. I've been all over the state in the last few months and just seeing one innovation after another. And it's why when I'm in the Senate, I look for every opportunity to showcase Vermont's creativity. The photographs in my office, the uh, ones I bring around in my iPad, I show others, from small businesses marketing homemade products to tech companies exploring new platforms in cybersecurity to food innovators. They're making Vermont the place for food, especially a good brew for those of you who might be interested. And here you've got faculty, staff, students, research at the forefront. Look at the departments within the school they're represented here today. The College of Medicine, the School of Business, the Colleges of Arts and Sciences, Engineering, and Math. Mr. President, I can't think of a better place to kick off Burlington's first innovation week than here at the university. We Vermonters may come from a small state, but we have big ideas. We punch above our weight. And later this week, many of those ideas will be on display at the Tech Jam. Today, they're on display here at UVM. And I can't wait to visit the exhibitors, and I'm going to be stepping off here so your keynote speaker can talk. And, and let me just brag about him for a moment in biotech. Uh, when I was a youngster, there were woolen mills in Winooski. They closed. Everybody thought that was the end of the world. Uh, all those wonderful minimum wage jobs were leaving. Now we have places like your, your company, the fire for minimum wage jobs. But what they also say to every student, train for these, study for these, bring your innovation, bring your ideas, because Vermont can be not only an incubator for ideas, it can be then the place where the ideas grow and we're a better state for it. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Senator. Pleasure to have you back with us again. So I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker now, Brian, uh, Brian Alpert, who received his mechanical engineering degree from UVM in 1983 and his MBA from UVM in 1992. After a short stint in uh, construction, Brian joined Biotech Instruments, a company founded in 1968 by his father, Dr. Norman Alpert, who was a member, a professor, and a chair of the Department of Physiology at the University of Vermont. I had the privilege of knowing uh, Norm while he was chair of the department, both as a colleague and as a friend, 
and had the rather unusual uh, experience of water skiing behind his yacht. Yes, his yacht. It was the fastest yacht on the lake. <laughs> uh, Briar became president and CEO of Biotech in 2000 and has since grown the company significantly. Biotech consistently wins awards for innovation, workplace wellness, as an outstanding place to work, and as business of the year. I'm delighted to welcome to the stage Briar Alpert. Thank, thank you, Richard, for that very generous introduction, pretty much how I wrote it. <laughs> also want to thank the senator for those warm words. Um, it really is a treat for me to be here today as a business that's roots really go right back to the University of Vermont, as a company that started in a garage. It's just uh, fantastic to now be asked to speak at an event uh, for Innovation Week that really celebrates uh, the companies uh, that have connection and linkage to the University of Vermont. I can also share with you, based on what I've seen and heard this morning, uh, all of you are so far ahead of where biotech was when we were your age that I would expect that you will be successful at a faster rate than biotech was. When I asked uh, Richard what should I speak about at this event, uh, Richard paused for a moment and then said, just explain to everybody how they can grow their business to $100 million a year, but don't take more than 10 minutes. <laughs> well, nine minutes. So that's what I'm going to endeavor to do. Um, I'm not going to talk about biotech's products or services, because I don't think that's really relevant to the conversation. Uh, but I would share that by many measures, biotech has been quite successful. Uh, we're on the cusp of our 50-year anniversary. We're a global leader in the products and services that we supply. Uh, we have over 400 employees, uh, subsidiaries in 10 countries. Uh, we have 100,000 customers in 60 countries from the South Pole to the North Pole. Um, we've been able to keep uh, all of our manufacturing, all of our engineering, all of our marketing, all of our back offices here, here in Vermont, and we remain a uh, privately held, privately run company. So I've painted a pretty rosy picture of the company, but I can share with you that's not always been the case. And we've had uh, many uh, near-death experiences, of which we explored them almost to their conclusion, um, the most recent of which was fully under my leadership. And so now, looking back over our history and looking at um, the, the successes and failures we've had, what are some of the foundational elements within the company that I've really found um, have been key to allowing us to survive our mistakes and important to allowing us to be successful when we make the right decision. So to begin with, culture and core values matter a lot. And so I would ask you to ask yourselves, what is the culture of your company? Even if you're two people, you have a culture. Uh, it might be interesting for the two of you to sit down and write it on a piece of paper because I bet they're different than what, than, than what you each think, and it may not be exactly what, what you want. Um, at Biotech, I think we didn't fully recognize what the culture was until time went by, but if I was to summarize it, it's really based on the tenants, mutual respect for everybody who works in the company, for our customers, for our uh, vendors. It's about delegating authority and responsibility deep into the organization. It's about sharing information with everybody. So we run open book. All of our employees know our revenue and profitability targets and performance on a monthly basis. And it's also a recognition that what we're doing is very complex and that mistakes are going to occur. And when we do, we admit them 
and then we fix the we fix the problem, not the blame. And this philosophy of running a company, um, it it's more than just words. It really uh, shows up in your deeds and your actions if you're true to your culture. It affects who we hire, who prospers and succeeds, who doesn't. Um, in many ways, it's the most important part of my job is to ensure that we live by the, the culture that I just described and that I communicate that widely throughout the organization so that whether I'm there or leadership is there or not, decisions are made that support that. So that doesn't have to be the culture for your company. I'm just saying it's worth the time and energy to set the foundation for what you want to be and then stay, stay true to that. I think, secondly, it's important to have a strategy. And so that sounds obvious. I think you probably all do have a strategy. Um, but you should be able to articulate it. And when biotech started, I would say we were underfunded understaffed and inexperienced. I, I don't know if that's consistent with anyone else's experience in the audience, but we needed a strategy that was supportive of that skill base. And so what we came up with was what we call today innovative fast follower. And so basically what we did was we would look out in the market, we'd see what was being successful, we'd see what was failing, and we'd be second or third to the market with something that was better than what existed or a recombination of features such that we could add value to a product offering that didn't exist in the market. This strategy was really important and valuable for biotech because we were almost never wrong. And we couldn't afford to be wrong. We just didn't have the resources to make, make mistakes. Um, we didn't have to make the investments to understand where the market was going because we could just see where it was going. And it allowed us to focus on execution. We got outstanding at execution because we were always behind, because we were always waiting uh, to see what was going to be successful. And so a result of that is we today can now produce products at two to three times the rate of our competitors because we are so fast and good at execution. Roughly 10 years ago, we, we had a change in strategy. As the company got stronger, we decided that we wanted to be a leader. So it was the wrong strategy in the beginning, but the right strategy as, as the company uh, strengthened. With that decision, uh, all, of our, all of our priorities changed. Um, to become a leader, we decided we have to be direct in the top 10 markets in the world. We have to start investing in, in application and scientists such that they can help us define where the market's going. We need to raise the brand awareness of the company around the world. And so it, it, as simple as a few words, innovative follower, fast follower, leader in the market, completely different strategies. And so you have to identify what's the right strategy for you, for your business, for what you're trying to accomplish. I think uh, something that marries with strategy is the appropriate capital structure. So depending on the strategy that you pick, you need a capital structure that supports that. Uh, we decided to go slow, and what that allowed us to do was fund the business really with um, uh, friends and family and then asset-based financing. So we borrowed money from the bank. Um, I'd say for a long time we were capital constrained. But the positive side of it was we're, we're st we still own 100% of the company, which is something that was really important to us. But that may be the wrong strategy for you. If your vision, if your requirement is we need to grow fast and scale quickly, then you need to get the resources, uh, the capital structure in place um, to support uh, that kind of growth. I think another important um, skill base that we developed was uh, the ability uh, to put in place tactical and strategic plans. Um, every year, we would put a plan in place by month uh, with a plan for our revenue and expenses and cost of goods. And I will share with you, we missed our plans for years. 
just year after year, we always fell short of our plans. But what happened was we got better at it. We got better at putting plans together. And when you miss a plan, we knew quickly that we were off plan and where we were off plan, and that allowed us to take steps to get back on plan. And that's very comforting for your back, for, for, for example, for, for your bank. Um, I think people recognize it's difficult to predict the future, but you need to respond to the reality of what's taking place, and it's much easier to do so if you have a plan in place to do that. I think another thing that, that has really become a strength in the company is our ability to manage risk. Uh, we don't do any project acquisition uh, major investment without a detailed financial model. And it's, it's just not that hard to do. It really is a spreadsheet that looks at the investments, looks at the returns. You can put in some sensitivity analysis that says, well, what if we're off by 5%? What if we're off by 10%? Um, what it allows you to do is either not bet the company, or at least know you're betting the company if, if, if you're going to take a decision. And so we have gotten quite good at, at that. And, and again, what it, allows, what it does for you is it, it allows you to know what the risk is as you proceed down any path, and then to assess how you're doing relative to your expectations. I think a, a, another piece of the puzzle, if you can do it, is to try to develop some diversification in your business. Um, if you only have one product or service going to one market, then you're very vulnerable to movements in that one product or market. And so you could be doing everything right, but because of something outside of your control, your business could fail. And so what we've been able to do over time is have multiple products going to multiple markets in multiple geographies. And so if you were to dig down and look at the details of our business, you'd see significant swings up and down in any one particular market. But in aggregate, you create a portfolio effect. And so what you see on the top line is smooth, consistent, predictable growth. So I think that's something that takes time, but is good to keep in the back of of your mind. And then I think no story about biotech is complete without talking about the founders of, of the company, of which my father was really the significant founder. He, he uh, was a professor in, in chairman of the physiology department. And he really partnered with a man named George Lure, who was head of the model making facility here. Um, at the University of Vermont. And this was really a, a significant and wise step uh, for both the university to put this model making facility in place and then to combine these two people. My father, who was, was, a, he was a, a, an excellent scientist, he was an optimist, he was curious, he, he loved people with uh, George Lure, who was an engineer. I would say he was a little pessimistic. Um, and uh, didn't always get along with everybody, but together they were an incredibly powerful combination to take a, a scientist and an engineer, a realist and an op optimist, um, and they really uh, uh, were key in setting the culture and core values that I spoke of in the beginning of my talk, uh, which uh, continue to serve as a rudder for guiding the company today. So um, to kind of wrap things up, if I was to summarize, I would say, uh, you know, be flexible and opportunistic, but always have a strategy that you can become great in something. And, and please do remember that the world is built by optimists. So thank, thank you very much.
excellent glass. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you've, uh, you've heard from 21 companies. Um, you've heard from Briar that you're ahead of the game compared to where he was. He's told you how to become a $100 million company in less than nine minutes. So we're done. I mean, there's nothing else to say. Thank you all for coming. I want to particularly thank people that have helped to make this event uh, run as smoothly as it has. Eugene Kozanski, Kerry Toksu, Jan Carson, and Alita Lavoie for making it all happen, and particularly uh, to Dan, who, Dan Harvey, who's really been the glue that's held the whole things together. So enjoy the rest of Innovation Week. There are many, many other events, and thank you all for coming today.